In the last video, I talked about how problems like addition could be solved in time uh, that was proportional to the size of the input or the, the number of digits um, in the input, and, and we refer to that running time as, as big O of n to say that it was proportional or linear to the size of the input. We also talked about multiplication and the standard grade school multiplication algorithm requiring uh, big O of n squared steps. In other words, it was a quadratic increase or a quadratic relationship between the the size of the input and the running time of the standard grade school multiplication algorithm and so on and so forth. And what I ended up saying at the end of the video is that if you in general have a running time of n to the k for some fixed constant value k, an integer k, uh, then we call that running time polynomial. Polynomial in the input size, or in this case polynomial in n, where n was the number of digits. Okay. Now, this term polynomial is extremely, extremely important, especially in the context of the p versus np problem. In fact, when we talk about p versus np, the p here stands for uh, polynomial, uh, specifically polynomial time. Okay. Now, the thing I want to point out is that when theoretical computer scientists talk about polynomial time algorithms, or they say that an algorithm runs in time polynomial in the size of the input, um, that turns out to be synonymous in computer science lingo, or really among theoretical computer scientists, as saying that the algorithm is in fact efficient. Okay, efficient, or alternatively, some people uh, refer to the algorithm as being feasible. Okay, feasible. Okay, and really, I, I think this makes some sense to some degree because let's say if you solve something in order n time or maybe order n squared steps or maybe even order n cubed steps, that, that's actually still pretty good uh, for the most part. But I think at the same time, you know, having said that, uh, this, this notion of calling polynomial time algorithms efficient or, or feasible uh, definitely can get a little bit confusing because, you know, it's entirely possible in, in the broader sense. Let's say if you had an algorithm that took I don't know, big O of n to the 1,000 steps. Uh, that would be very slow, okay, uh, in practice. There, there's no reason that would be very efficient. But when theoretical computer scientists see n to the 1,000, they talk about that as being efficient, okay? So I, I want to mention that this, there's this distinction where even though I might be using the term efficient in the sense of a theoretical computer scientist, that same term may not apply in practice necessarily, okay? Um, and Despite that, I'm going to stick to this particular nomenclature of efficient since that's what most theoretical computer scientists use. I guess that's in part why they are theoretical computer scientists or theorists. Uh, though I should point out that in all fairness, um, there are a lot of other very important mathematical reasons why thinking in terms of polynomial time as being efficient uh, is a useful way to, to conceive of the problem. And it, it may be worth also pointing out that, you know, in practice, now we never see, we rarely see algorithms that are like n to the 1,000 steps and so on for any practically interesting problem. Uh, for the most part, when you have a well-posed problem that occurs in practice, uh, we either find algorithms that work in like n squared or n cubed steps and so on, but we never find a practical or reasonable situation, at least not commonly, where the best known algorithm is like n to the 1,000, okay? Now, I also want to be a little bit more precise here, and I did say that I'll, I'll try not to be too mathematically rigorous in this series of videos because I don't want to lose sight of the underlying intuition. Uh, but at the same time, I still want to make sure that there's some level, there's some element of, of mathematical correctness to everything I'm saying. Okay, And one thing I do want to point out, uh, and I won't belabor this point too much, is that when computer scientists talk about this class of problems P, which, which is said stands for polynomial time, what they typically mean are not just general problems. They typically restrict the class P to refer to what are known as decision problems. Okay, and decision problems are basically problems whose answers can fall into one of two buckets. They're, they're either uh, going to be, uh, the answer is either going to be yes or no, at least some type of a decision. Okay, and a decision problem is one whose answer is binary. In other words, the answer is either yes or no. And it turns out you can pretty much take any problem out there, and if that problem is asking for a more complex answer, it turns out you can take that problem and convert it into a series of decision problems that lead ultimately to that same answer. And likewise, if you have efficient decision algorithms for certain kinds of problems, you can actually convert those efficient decision algorithms into 
more generic algorithms. And that in maybe one way to think about this, this is kind of like the game 20 questions where you're trying to come up with, uh, you know, a, a given answer to something, and, and you're, you're trying to do it by virtue of coming up with a series of decision problems that ultimately leads to the, the final answer, okay? And that's maybe a bit more intuition. Uh, and, and for the most part, I'm not going to harp too much on this decision versus search or decision versus optimization uh, distinction because you can really convert one type of problem to another type of problem. And the blow up, the amount of extra effort required is not going to be so much greater. In fact, if you can do one thing in polynomial time, typically you can do the other in polynomial time. So if you can solve the decision version in polynomial time, you may be able to solve a more generic version or a search version or an optimization version in polynomial time as well. Okay. Now, again, I've been very, very deliberate in my wording. And in fact, one thing that I was very deliberate about when I talked about, let's say, the, the running time of the grade school multiplication algorithm uh, was in reference to the running time of that algorithm. And I said the running time, the running time of the traditional grade school multiplication algorithm was big O of n squared. Okay. Now, does that really mean fundamentally that the underlying computational complexity of the multiplication algorithm in general is also n squared? In other words, is the grade school approach to multiplication the best you can do? And the answer actually turns out to be no. Uh, there are faster algorithms for multiplication. So for example, uh, there is an algorithm that was developed by someone named uh, Karatsuba. And the Karatsuba multiplication algorithm can actually multiply two n-digit numbers in approximately big O of n to the 1.585 steps. Now 1.585 is smaller than 2, and so this algorithm actually runs in uh, time significantly less than big O of n squared. So it's a much faster algorithm for multiplying two n-digit numbers. Okay, is that the best you can do? Again, actually, it turns out not to be. There's actually, since the Karatsuba algorithm, there's actually another algorithm that was uh, due to uh, Schonage and uh, Strassen. And their algorithm actually runs in time, and this is a, a very messy expression, so I won't belabor what it means, but it's basically n uh, log n log log n, okay? And I, I won't go into what this whole thing means, but suffice it to say that uh, it's faster than n to the 1.585. In fact, it's also faster than n squared, okay? So this is a much faster algorithm, significantly faster algorithm for multiplying two n-digit numbers, okay? Is there an even faster algorithm? Actually, there is, but I'm really not going to go into it now. I think I've, I've talked about this far too uh, long, much longer than I actually thought I would. Uh, but one interesting question that comes up in this context is, you know, do we really know the fastest algorithm for multiplication? And here our understanding actually starts to break down in terms of what theoretical computer scientists or computational complexity theorists know versus what they don't know. Okay? The real answer is we don't know if there's a better algorithm out there. Okay? What we do know, theoretically speaking, is that the lower bound, the minimum number of steps I need to be able to multiply uh, two n-digit numbers is going to be big O of n. I'm going to need at least a number of steps that's proportional to the number of digits. That I know for sure because I need to be able to read each digit to be able to multiply it. Okay? And it's the same as we talked about with regard to addition, an analogous line of reasoning. Uh, if I don't read the entire numbers or if I miss a digit, then I won't be able to multiply those two numbers correctly. So at the very least, the trivial lower bound is I need time that's proportional to the number of digits to be able to even multiply those two numbers. Okay? But the best algorithm that we know of is actually significantly slower than big O of n, okay? And as a result, uh, it seems to indicate that the, the number of steps um, required to multiply is much greater than that the number that's indicated by, by something that's proportional to the number of digits. In other words, there's this gap, okay? There's this gap between the, the best known lower bound that we can reason about and the best known upper bound, the best known algorithm for solving this problem, okay? And we don't know uh, what, how big this gap actually is. We actually don't, on, on two regards, first of all, we don't know of a better line of reasoning that suggests that multiplication takes more than big O of n steps. And as a result, we, the best algorithm we know today is significantly slower than n. And so we don't know if we actually have the best algorithm out there because we don't know what the intrinsic complexity of multiplication is, okay? 
we know that at least some number of steps proportional to the number of digits is required. That's a pretty trivial observation. Uh, is there some better lower bound than the trivial one? And we don't know. Okay. Now, in either case, in either case, this problem of multiplication is actually a very easy problem for a computer. Okay. You can take two huge numbers. You can take numbers that are a thousand digits each, and a computer can multiply them together in a split second and produce an answer. Okay. What I want to do now is I want to switch gears. I want to think about whether there are problems for which this gap this gap in understanding between the best known lower bounds and the best known upper bounds, in other words, the, the minimum time required and the best known algorithm, is that are there are problems for which that gap is much bigger. And there are problems for which our gap of understanding is much bigger. And I'm going to start to talk about those in the next video.